Do you ever feel people aren't paying enough attention to your amazing product or service? People choose brands that emotionally connect with them. Welcome to this new episode of the Dominate Your Market podcast. Our guest is Ernie Harker, a hyper-creative branding expert, author, and keynote speaker. Ernie is skilled in campaign development, loyalty programs, design, advertising, illustration, video production animation, and Adobe Creative Suite. He's an entrepreneur, TV host, and Ironman athlete. He's the author of the book, Your Brand Sucks. In this episode, Ernie talks about how well you should understand the value of establishing distinctive branding and preventing business negligence. Stay tuned and don't miss out. I want to welcome you to the Dominant Your Market podcast, where we interview leaders, CEOs, founders, and high-impact business development professionals to get their insights on how you can grow your business efficiently, build an amazing company, and still have a life. Today's guest is Ernie Harker. Ernie is a hyper-creative branding expert, author, and keynote speaker. Ernie is skilled in campaign development, loyalty program, design, advertising, illustration, video production, animation, and Adobe Creative Suite. He's an entrepreneur, TV host, Iron Man athlete. We got to talk about that. And I love the title of his book, Your Brand Sucks. Dude, I'm so like <laughs> loving that, loving that title. Welcome to the show, Ernie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm pumped, dude. I, uh, you know, I have to talk right away about an incident we had on LinkedIn, and quite a few people saw it. And uh -huh. um, for, for our listeners, I want to bring it up because I want everybody to go check out what you did. So for our listeners, what happened was we had a podcast scheduled and it slipped through the cracks, technology, calendar. I dropped the ball. Let's yeah. just be honest. I dropped the freaking uh, ball. <laughs> you know what? I, I appreciate, appreciate the humility, but let's just call it what it is, technology, whatever. And so for our listeners, Ernie did a sketch of me that was pretty fucking spot on, man. Like I was like, oh shit, what the hell? He did a sketch of me side by side, posted on LinkedIn with an apology, which was over and above. And it struck me immediately. I was like, and so I reposted it and got a lot of traction on my LinkedIn. So all for all of you listening, go to Ernie's LinkedIn, find one of his posts where he did it because it was, it was a very creative move you did. And it really you stood out like in that branding, right? Like you stood yeah. out like a sore thumb. So uh, thank you for that, for what you did. And You're I was, I was so looking forward to having you on, man. I mean, that was, uh, that kind of kickstarted my whole thought process of who the hell is this dude? Well, you know, what's kind of crazy is that I studied illustration in college. I was an artist in high school like that. I wanted to be an animator for Disney when I was a little kid. Oh, nice. And so I was so invested into being creative and doing art and drawing and stuff like that. And it became the, the baseline of my profession. I, that's mm. how I got into the advertising, marketing, and then developed in branding. And what's crazy is I didn't realize that that was an interesting or a cool skill to have. Like it's in my back pocket. And I'm on, I was talking to this other guy <laughs> and he said, hey, if you want to get people's attention, because I, I had just sketched him randomly. I, I was going to meet with him and I had never met him before. So I sketched him. He goes, dude, <laughs> you, if you do this, it will get people's attention. I go, oh, really? So, so you never know what kind of skills you have because we underestimate them. Well, you know, that's a damn good explanation right there where you had something, you kind of almost took it for granted. Yep, yep. I think everybody has something, you know, and it doesn't have to be a creative skill like that. Yeah, but for you, it's gold, man, because yeah. it's it's visual, and human beings we're visual. So we, when we see something, especially an image like that, that is. So I would be pulling that out all day long. That that and that could be one of your monikers, dude. Like just yeah. sketch people, man, or just you know, and post it on LinkedIn. Because um, for me, when I reposted it, you know, and I I've got a LinkedIn coach who said I should have, we would have gotten even more traction if I would have taken your post and just made it a new post. So I'm learning mm -hmm. LinkedIn even more. Now, granted, go to, go to my post, that repost, it got lots of traction, man. Yeah. And lots yeah. Well, of it comments. helps both of us. Yeah. It helps yeah. both of us. Oh. But you know what? We don't know what our, our magic sauce is until somebody we trust and talk to sees it and tells That's us. True. Because we're looking at the forest, we can't even see the trees. Well, you know, when you mentioned my book, Dominate Your Market, mm -hmm. it, it, for me, um, that's 25 years of my soul that I put in this mm -hmm. thing, right? And it's yeah. 
fitness, it's athletics, it's it's being an entrepreneur, the ups and downs, it's pivoting, it's all these things, it's growing your revenues. And that was a brain dump, man. And I did yeah. it in 47 days. I wrote oh that my book. Gosh. In four, yeah, I did it in 47. I went 100 miles an hour. But when I did it, it really, people that read it, my ex-wife, she read it and she said, oh my God. She said, <laughs> she said, if anybody ever wants to know your stuff is true, they can talk to me. That's my ex-wife, by the way. They can talk to me. And I said, you know, so she took the book, read it in a day. She said, she read it in one day. Yeah. 200 pages. And she was like, wow. So it goes to show you that what we do and what's in our brains, we need to let it out, dude. We yeah. need to let in full force, man. And you I do. You, you do. And, you, yeah, in your book, book, you, to me, I had to, it was so dense. I mean, it's, it's not 800 pages, but it is so dense. It's like you're reading and you have to stop in second and, and think about, let it process because it's coming <laughs> at you with, with a lot of force. Yeah, so well, and it's like no nonsense. What do you say? No BS. <laughs> well, well, and, and you know, for you, I love the idea that you know I went to your website, I did some research on you, and you and some of the brands you work with. God, and we'll talk about this. Wow, yeah. I mean, three billion dollar brand. Let's hello, hello. Yeah. So um, I feel like even on LinkedIn, I don't know if that's your main platform, but you're a hidden gem on that platform, dude. Like you are hidden right now. Meaning you Thank are. You. You're Thank you. Thank you, but but dang it. You know, <laughs> well, well, it's just, you don't I think, be hidden. You well, it's, be it's just, well, it's, I think for you is LinkedIn. Is it a, are, are you putting any time into it? Is it a, a new I platform? I am, and, but I'm kind of new. I'm one of those guys and I might be a lot like you because I've already seen some similarities, but I, I do not consume very much social media mm -hmm. and oh, because I'm not a consumer of it, I'm not a proprietor of it. So it's been a, it's been a forced labor for me because i know that's where my audience is oh boy and because my audience is there i need to change my mindset and actually get in after it and so it's like i've been working on it for about eight months like okay. in earnest where i've been really focusing on it but just i i'm still struggling to try to unlock the magic i thought i put i put way too much time in my content but i don't want to go half-assed at, oh, at anything yeah, I I don't believe, yeah, I don't believe in half-assed. That didn't work for me. But, you know, yeah. I think, you know, we don't need to spend the whole time talking about LinkedIn, but I think for you, LinkedIn is an algorithm. And mm -hmm. the only way to, to strengthen the algorithm in your favor is show LinkedIn you're engaging and commenting. And that's, and for all of our listeners, by the way, get somebody on your team. If you're a CEO listening to this, get somebody on your team to be the proponent, the champion for your company, by the way. So even though I'm talking to you directly, but anybody listening, but it's, it's the engagement, not only it's the engagement that you put in because yep. LinkedIn says, okay, this guy's spending some time on the platform. He's liking people. He's engaging with people. We're going to show his post more often. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you got to piggyback on some of the bigger players too, by the way, too. So if you can find a couple of bigger players, piggyback off them because you're so effing creative, man. I mean, you could, well, you, you could dominate these people, man, but um, I don't want to talk about LinkedIn anymore. So let's talk about this real quick. So um, yeah. why should a company, not so much an individual, because you, you're, you're an individual, I'm an individual. Yeah. Why, yep. should, a, why should a company care about their brand? Like, you know, they're a $5 million company, a $20 million company. Why should they care about their brand? Especially in business to business, you know, because uh, business to consumer, it, it's pretty oh. obvious, Hello. right? <laughs> Nike freaking Apple you, and the, all the big ones that you talk about. Every time I go to a conference, it's Nike, Apple, Starbucks, blah, it. blah, blah, right? But when it comes to like business to business, you know, in, in every brand, every company, we create a product or service that is highly similar to another product or service. And what ends up happening is we spend a lot of time talking about the features and benefits and the value proposition. One of the things that we don't realize as business to business is we shop and we buy the same way a consumer buys. 100%. We buy emotionally. We not, in fact, a study, studies are done all the time to reinforce this, that 95% of all purchase decisions are uh, yeah. subconscious and emotional based. And if we have not integrated our brand emotionally into the hearts of our audience, and that's not the end consumer, it's 
the it's the CEO, it's the it's the CTO, it's whoever it is that's making the, the choice. He needs to have felt something about your brand before he even knows what your cost value proposition is. Because his this his decision is made up among by all these different um secondary experiences with your brand before he is he's faced with the 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 opportunity to buy or not. And right. how he, is he even going to recognize those touch points, those experiences as your company if you haven't branded them or 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 dip them and immerse them and soak them in some type of a visual and verbal personality that says this came from brand X. Right. Otherwise you're going to go, oh, I because brands are highly forgettable. Yep. Like if, if there's not a concentrated flavor to it, it's highly forgettable. It's vanilla. I just right. forgot about it. Right. So you can market like crazy, but if the brand isn't very sticky or the message isn't very sticky, it's going to be forgotten. Right. So it becomes imperative for large organizations to develop a personality for their company that's reflected in a very strong look and feel, easy to identify, easy to um, connect. Like I'm, I'm people who are not watching. I am like holding my chest with my yeah, fingertips. Yeah. I in, love it. I love it. Intensely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, it's awesome. That's how I'm feeling. Yeah. Well, you know what's interesting is, I, I. I I challenge a lot of my, so a lot of my clients are kind of the five to $20 million business rate, small businesses, right? You know, 50 employees, 100 employees, but I challenge all of them because like, I'll even go to their website. They're nowhere to be found. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, the founder, owner, CEO of the company, nowhere to be found. And I challenge them and say, now, now listen, do you believe in your product or service? Oh, hundred percent. Okay. Well, how about you share it? How about you show it? And they're like, what do you mean? How about a video? How about anything, right? Something, mm -hmm. show that you're a human being, show the passion you have for your product or service, not so much from a sales standpoint, but truly a passion standpoint. Yeah. And I've had about 10% of my clients buy that Kool-Aid and do even like one video where I'll script the video, they shoot mm -hmm. it, we get it on the website, we social media it, and they see a bump. They see yep. a bump like that yep. because- I always tell everybody, don't hide behind your freaking website. Even if you are the CEO, people want yeah. to know who's the head dog of this yeah. company, right? Yeah, yeah. There's, I, I think there's a, there's a correlation between people we know and people we do business with. Like we, we choose to hang out with people that we like, that, that kind of reflect our personalities. Yep. They, 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 they have our values. But if I don't know, if there's some like mystical being <laughs> uh, un, a faceless being behind the curtain. Like, how, how am I going to trust you? I don't trust a company. We don't trust companies. We trust people. People. And if we, if we don't have some human aspect on the other side of that, that website, uh, I'm just, oh, here's the problem. Uh, seriously, here's the problem. <laughs> Most of us think that we are rational, that we're figuring things out. We've got like spreadsheets and crap that we're like messing with. Like, oh, Cost benefit analysis features, blah, blah, blah. Hey, nobody has time for that. Right. What, what I do is I go, I listen to my friends. I listen to people that, that know, and they tell me, you know, we had this experience. These guys suck. These guys were awesome. Now I have a preconceived idea of who I should go with based on a reputation. That reputation was built from an experience. And that experience began with some type of attention, some type of brand oh, recognition, sure. right? Mm -hmm. So all these things in this business ecosystem add up to an overall impression from a customer. And if it's not intentional, if it's not like, what do I want my customer to think and feel about me? There's no way to engineer that experience. Right. If right. you're just trying to convince people, you know, math, 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 um, 95, you're going to miss 95% of the people. Great right. job. If that's your intent, great job. You hit 5%. Right. And you know what? I would even go as far as saying that the majority, I'm going to say 90%, but I don't know statistically this, but mm -hmm. the majority, which is above 50%, the majority of companies have no brand. It's yeah. like you, 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 you see their website or you see their business name or you see whatever. And I'm like, I don't know what you're about. I have yeah. no idea what you're about. Like, I don't know. So, so in that situation, unless you're a Nike, Apple, Mm -hmm. It has billions and billions of dollars to spend on just branding. Yeah. You, you better figure out, number one, a brand message. Mm 
what's yeah. what's the value you bring to your marketplace with your messaging? Mm-hmm. And you're right. And and I feel like most companies are not doing it. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. And you know what's here's what's interesting. Okay, you and I, dudes, we know a little bit about sports, right? Oh, Athletics yeah. and stuff like that. I can tell you look a little swole. So <laughs> here's the thing. Branding, I, I, when I get on uh, in meetings with people, branding, they immediately think of their product, that their brain has to go to the product. Think about athletics. If, if you're to watch baseball, if you went to the New York baseballers, because their product is baseball, imagine them being the New York baseballers. And then you go to LA and they have the LA baseballers, but oh, their statistics are better. You know, we have a better RBI. We have better home field advantage. We have this. And this. Well, why would I want to watch the LA baseballers versus the New York baseballers or even the Baltimore baseballers? The, the Orioles have nothing to do with baseball. The, the, the Yankees, that has nothing to do with baseball. But it's a, pers- it's a personality. It's an icon. It's a theme. It's whatever that helps differentiate from the other baseballers. And it creates a culture. I was going to say that. I was just going to say right? that. Yep. Yep. So yep. we got to, like, when it comes to branding, we need to take a step away from the product and service that we sell Boy. and figure out, like, what is our personality and, and how are we going to get our personality reflected in our marketing so that people give a crap about the statistics and the features and benefits that we offer? You know, one thing I think about is, is when you talk about emotion, what goes hand in hand with emotion is, is feeling, feeling. What do you want your ideal customer prospect to feel when they see or hear your brand? Yeah. What do you want them to feel, right? Because that, that gets deep. And then, yeah. you know, then you can start having team meetings about that, you know, and get everybody th- dumping ideas on the table of like, well, what do we want them to feel? As opposed to, oh, well, we offer X widget mm-hmm. and that's the widget does this. Well, yeah. in the end, what, does, what are you hoping your ideal customer prospect feels and it's that whole idea of you don't buy a drill, you you get the hole, you you pay for the hole, right? Right. right? So so it, you know there's 500 drills out there. Well, I mean you want the hole. That's all you care about. Mm-hmm. So again, what's that? That's a feeling. That's an outcome. That's a result. Yeah. The hole is the result. The drill, 500 of them, just go get one and drill the damn thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So so I but mean the one what, the one with the, the the advertising that most resonates with you that makes you feel good, like. Is it because you saw the Makita girl calendar poster, <laughs> you know, with all these girls holding drills and stuff and sexy poses and stuff? Now, I've been to, make, you know, to uh, places where those things are highly prom- prominently displayed. For sure. For and, sure. And they're going, man, I love Makita. Is it because they have 800 more horsepower or they hold battery charge? No, it's like, I like hot chicks and they're on the wall and Makita, you know, yeah, I'm in. You yeah. know? No, no, of course it, the it, product it, has to work and you know it has to deliver. But that those are kind of like table stakes now in the game. Right, if you're in the right. business, you you better have a kick butt product. You do. Right. But you're not gonna what? last. You're not gonna but last. But that and that's not gonna and that's not gonna be enough though. It's it's right. enough to get to the game, but then you've got to like get attention. Yeah, you've got to be strategic. You've got to, and you've got to kind of do look at what your competitors are doing. You know, mm-hmm. and, and and what you're going to see most of the time is similarities across the board. Everybody's doing basically the same thing. Well, and that's like with you and I, you know, even going to your website, I love your website. Like we'll talk about your website at the end, but just energy and dynamic and just, you know, I mean, you are a presence, no doubt. It jumps right off the screen, which um, I can resonate with because I feel like I, I'm very much in you, that category. You're the same. Yeah, yeah you're so, the same. And I think a lot of people feed off that energy because I think in their lives and even B2B, the people that are like the decision makers, the buyers in a company, they've got stresses and all those things. But when they come across somebody, high energy, high passion, um, you know, that really has an outlook on life that's very positive, that's infectious, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and people, can, they'll make a decision kind of like, I, this dude's cool. Like yeah. I want his stuff. And, and they might be interviewing five other people for that same thing. But they come across you and they're like, Ernie, this, this dude's, I, I, I don't know what it is. I like this guy. He's hired. Well, it's, done. it's highly intentional. Like before this phone call, I'm just chilling. I'm working like crazy. I'm focused. I'm not, I'm not on. But my brand, like, is it very intentional? I've written it out. Oh, yeah. I am. I bring energy. Like that, my number one thing, like my logo is Earn Burn. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I want I, people to I think love that. Man, that guy was on fire. I, literally, yep. that's what I want people to think when when they experience me. My background is set to make sure am I professional? Am I highly energetic? Everything about my content is creative, high energy, so that when people say, "Hey, who do you know anybody that's like like we need some energy in our business. We need some folks in our business. Who would be good to to come and have speak to us or whatever?" I'm like, "Pick me." Pick me because I've intentionally created that brand right. so that people, when they want that. Now, if they want someone who's chill, you do not want me. You don't There's want me no, either. You do not want me. I'm coming in at 100 miles an hour. <laughs> so right. I don't make break some things in the process. <laughs> like you some, know some sacred well, in, cows. Well, it's interesting because like even going back to LinkedIn for a split second, you know, it's a platform that's 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 been very conservative. It's been very, it was a resume website for so long. Now it's evolving. People are moving over from Instagram. People, you know, and because you see the selfie, the selfies now, right? Mm -hmm. And it's gotten a bit much, to be quite honest with you. Um, I think a lot of the, a lot of the gals have come over and and they're they're doing their thirst. What's that called? Thirst traps. Thirst traps, yeah. right? But and that's going to happen wherever we're at. But but the yeah. point being is that even on LinkedIn now, there's a way to to come across and show that voice, show your personality. And I'm still finding mine, by the way, because um, you know, it's interesting. I had a person on a call about two weeks ago, not a podcast. And I was fuck this, fuck that shit, all this stuff, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. <laughs> Just going crazy. And, and they're like, and they said, I've got your, it was a gal. And she said, I've got your LinkedIn pulled up right now. The guy I'm talking to isn't a guy on LinkedIn. And I go, really? Mm -hmm. And she goes, oh no, 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 no. You are way different. And so that was a wake up call for me to go. Oh yeah. Interesting, right? Now we yeah. can't get on LinkedIn and fuck this, fuck that, drop <laughs> F-bombs everywhere. <laughs> right. I think we can I we can do it discreetly. But again, that is the brand, right? You you yeah. are who you are. And I always say in my book, I even say own it. Yeah. Own who you are and fuck it. You know, if there's 95% of people like, oh, I don't like how he talks and he cusses yeah. and he's 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 so wound up, it's not for me. <laughs> That's fine. Awesome. Absolutely fine. Because the yep. people who like you will love you. Yep. Yep. So, so, hey, I want to get into something because we're flying yep. in this, this podcast. Your book, your brand sucks. Okay. Now, listen, <laughs> I haven't even gotten it yet. I'm going to buy it after this podcast. Okay, because, good. <laughs> no, because um, the title, boom. Yeah. I mean, hello. Talk, what, what was the genesis of the book? Talk a little bit about the book. You know, we'll do links at the end of this thing. But you bet. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to just kind of find out how you came up with the book, just that edgy title, all of that. Awesome. Well, um, so I started as an illustrator. I worked for an ad agency. This is in 1993. And before that, I was doing all kinds of artwork, making money, doing Damn. drawings, T-shirts, whatever, right? In college. So I, I get this job as an illustrator, uh, like a storyboard artist and a concept illustrator for an, a big ad agency. And I am cranking. I'm good. They love me. I I move into design, interactive design, but I always keep illustration. So I'm acquiring this these skill sets of creative production. Hmm. I start my own company that grows, and we're doing all kinds of creative production. And what I found myself doing, like websites, you know, business identities, stuff like that. And what I found myself doing is we were constantly trying to hit a moving target. And what, what I mean by that is we would develop a logo. We develop like a brand scheme or whatever, based on what the client was telling us, we'd show it to them and they'd say, well, you know, my daughter doesn't like it. She's studying design in high school right now. And she doesn't like it. And my wife, you know, she, she loves green. We should put green into this. And so I'm like going, wait a second. So I'm basically chasing a, a ever changing preference. Instead of making decisions on a strategy. And so, so what I decided to do is like, I've got I've to nail down my clients before any creative discussion happens. Like, well, what makes you special? What makes you different? And so I call that your brand spark. Um, or, or some people call it their unique selling proposition, right? What is it that makes you different and not your product? This is not your product. I don't give a crap about your product yet. What makes you different, your business different? Once you understand what that is, that needs to get into every message you sell, you, you promote. So 
you find, find out what your unique selling proposition is. We call it your brand spark. Identify your core customer. Then describe like li really detail. And we do, we, I get this wrong for myself all the time. It's just hard. It's hard to do because no one wants to drill that deep. Right. Because we want to sell to everybody, which we should, but we should market to a few. Right. Sell to everybody because they're coming <laughs> and they've got money. So sell <laughs> to them. And then uh, I asked them, how would you describe your brand? D give me some descriptors. Now, I want you to choose five or six adjectives, two of which can't be used to describe anybody else in your category. Ooh. Oh, crap. Ooh. And I go, and here's why. Because if anybody can use the same adjectives to describe your company as anybody else's, then there's no difference. So I want to, I need, we need to drill down and see what that is. Once you figure out what that brand strategy looks like, your, um, your brand spark, your core customer, those adjectives. I also uh, do your, um, your core belief. Like, why are you doing this? Like you could be a real estate agent or, you know, just make money on stock market. Why are you in, uh, why are you a dentist? Why are you, a car salesman, you know, what, why are you in this? Once you know what those, those descriptions are, then you can choose brand elements like colors, fonts, textures, logos, et cetera, that fit that requirement. So now it's no longer, Hey, do you, I don't know if I like red. Well, you just told me you guys are highly aggressive, energetic, passionate people. And you're telling me you love light blue. You can keep, you can wear light blue, <laughs> but light blue does not convey the level of energy and aggression that your company has. In fact, there's very few colors that will express that. So colors can help you do that. Textures, patterns, fonts, um, vocabulary. These are the building blocks of a brand. Then you use those things on your website, on your LinkedIn, on your, your podcasts and all those kinds of things, your ads so that people can identify you visually and also your, the tone of your message by the what you say and how you say it. But that's why most brands suck because they go right to a logo and a website when they what? come up with a brand, their, their, their company idea instead of, why am I doing this? What's the emotion I want to, to uh, inspire in people when they see my brand? That feeling. Because yep. When you know what that is, then you can architect an experience for that out desired outcome. Yeah, when you, when you think of brand and, and going back to what you just said about how do you want your ideal customer to feel when they see your brand? It, it's almost like Nike way back in the day. And actually, I did a, a model for Nike for a couple of years way back in the day. Mm -hmm. But they, um, and I did a commercial with them, but they, they want, when they first came out, they wanted people to relate to Pro athletes. They wanted people to feel like a basketball player. They mm -hmm. wanted people to feel like Michael Jordan, right? So I want to get his shoes because I'm going to feel like Michael Jordan. I'm going yeah. to be Michael Jordan. That was that yeah. feeling, right? And, that, and people don't understand that when you look at those big brands, how they started way back when mm -hmm. that they, they had intention, obviously intention. Um, and they didn't have money back then. Way back in the day, Nike started with a waffle machine in Eugene, Oregon, right? I mean, <laughs> right, right. so, so uh, it, a lot of people say, oh, well, it's easy when you get billions of dollars. No, no, no. They started yeah. with zero. It's they actually started... easier when you're smaller. You're more, you're, you're, you, can, you have much more control over it. You can make adjustments as you go. Whereas if you've got a huge $3 billion brand, if you want to make a change, that's a lot of capital you got to invest a lot of capital. Yep. Yep. And a lot of decision makers too, right? A lot of, a lot mm -hmm. of, you know, paperwork and red tape, but uh, Hey, talk about, um, I know you mentioned, and I want to make sure I get this name right. Maverick adventures first stop. Yes. Is that correct. Yep. Yep. So, so yep. you did, you did some work from them and I went on their website as well. Talk mm -hmm. about that. Cause I think it's a, would you say it's a $3 billion brand? Yeah, it was, it was um, about uh, five years ago. It's much bigger now. But oh, wow. um, yeah, so it's a convenience store brand. Yeah, it's a convenience store. Like I love Seven <laughs> Eleven. It's like uh, the Quick Trip or something. Yeah. I mean, and so I've been in the convenience store world for a long time because in uh, in two thousand one, Maverick is a convenience store chain that's that's located centrally in the Mountain West, specifically in the Salt oh, wow. Lake City area. Okay, okay. so we've got. You know, at the time, there was probably like 127, 130 stores. That's a good-sized company. 
but it had been branded since the foundation or the inception of the company to be a country store, Maverick Country Stores. The colors were brown and orange. Everything was cowboy Western themed. And at the time, the, uh, the third generation owner, him and his cousin, Brad and Mike Call, they were cousins. Mike was the previous CFO, became the CEO. Brilliant leader, by the way. He was one of those types of uh, executives that trusted his people. Like he'd get the right guy in the right place. And we would have a discussion, an executive committee, and then he'd go around, hey, last minute, last thoughts, get feedback from everybody. He'd make the decision. And we would, because he was listening to everybody and trusted everybody, we would all lockstep behind him. That's, that's a phenomenal leader. So anyway, that's, yeah, that's good. That's Mike. And then um, uh, his cousin, Brad, was the chief legal officer and the marketing director. Super, it's weird, but he's super creative mm-hmm. and super bold. So he hated the whole cowboy Western theme. So we need to change this. He was talking to a media guy to buy TV ads. And the media guy goes, you need to talk to Ernie. He's really good at coming up with creative stuff. And so I met with him and we came up with this idea. You know, we did a bunch of research, like it's not super scientific, but a b- bunch of research. And we found that most people hated going to convenience stores because they have to buy gas. No one wants, like, I want to buy fun stuff, not gas. And so, but we found that most people enjoyed going to a convenience store on their way to their favorite adventure, mm-hmm. like uh, skiing, hiking, mountain biking, climbing. And in the Utah area, the like Mountain West, that's the freaking world's playground. Yeah, for sure. You know? yeah. So we thought this is authentic to who we are. We could, we could make Maverick Adventures first stop. And so we came with the tagline. We used that to be like the filter for our customer experience. So if they walk into a store, we need to change it from saloon to, yeah. hey, you're walking into the great outdoors. We painted the ceilings blue. We covered the walls with wallpaper, a 360 awesome. degree wallpaper mural. We, we put like wood, t- wood uh, flooring, like, like really nice looking wood uh, rustic flooring in um, to make it feel like you're at Sean White's cabin yeah. in Alaska. <laughs> like totally cool, yeah. but definitely outdoors. And so the whole theme became this adventure brand that skyrocketed Maverick's success. It, it grew like 600% in the eight years. I actually, uh, 10 years later, they hired me to be their executive director of marketing. So I was in there uh, in the executive committee and did that for eight years. Wow. I left four years ago because I wanted to finish my book that I didn't take 47 days. It took me <laughs> like forever and it well. was a nightmare. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I uh, yeah, I, well, you know, it's funny with that, with my book, I had a book writing coach who I ended up not hiring, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and she, she was, uh, she says, um, how long do you think it'll take to write your book? And I said, well, what's normal? And she said, well, six months to a year, probably something like that. And I said, I'll get it done in 90 days. And she said, no way. She literally said that to me. She goes, no yeah. way. And then she, and then she goes, what's the budget? And I said, well, what's, a standard budget. You tell me. And she said, $25,000. Mm-hmm. I said, I'll do it in under $5,000. So <laughs> she on says, day, no way. No way. <laughs> and so on day 47, when I wrote the last word, I sent her an email and I said, I want to thank you so much for your positive encouragement. Right. And uh, <laughs> the, the book's done. And she came back, no way. And I go, yeah, the book's done. It'll be in print in the next 30 days. So, so, so the book was written in 47 days. 30 days later is what? 77 days. So it was in print on Amazon in under 90 days, under 90 That's days. That's amazing. So, but That's I, amazing. I say that because, you know, a lot of people, and again, you want to get back to branding and all that. We have to own who we are, right? Yeah. And I think even as a company, you know, you're going to get a lot of naysayers. You're going to get a lot of people like that company sucks, man. You know, you know the, the product they offer is boring. It's this, it's that. Well, you should listen to that feedback, right? You know, and you mm-hmm. should you should take a serious look at what you're offering the marketplace. And when you, when you brought up the USP, I don't know if you've gotten this point in my book yet, but the USP I talk about in my book is market dominating position. Mm. And the market dominating position is the USP on steroids. It's nice. actually taking a USP and, and, and going 
above and beyond everybody else and taking all that normal bullshit of, well, we do this and we do, because everybody does the same thing. What do you do that addresses the biggest pain point and what is the benefit that addresses that biggest pain point? That's your market dominating position. And what, how do you do it so differently that when mm-hmm. somebody sees it, they're like, holy shit, who are these guys? That's when you create that positioning. That yep. it, you are the no-brainer but, at that point. But most businesses, they can't figure that out, honestly, because what, what I found is no. that they have been telling themselves and, and each other, this is what makes us special. This is what makes us special. And nobody has the, um, the, the authority or the position to challenge that. And if you do, if you challenge us, you guys, I don't think so. Because I know our competitors, they say the same thing. It's like, oh, no, no, we do it better. Like one of the things I'll ask people, what's your brand spark? And they'll say, it's our people or it's our quality. And I'm like, hey, guys, I think your people are great. And I'm sure your quality is awesome. But how likely is it that your competitors are using that same message as their point of difference? Well, but, but we're, we're more quality at a cheaper price. Okay. You see where this is going? We're, we're going to all race to the bottom line. I was just say race and to getting the bottom. smaller and smaller margins. So this sounds like a fun deal. Whereas yeah. really good brands, like they, they command premium pricing. That's the game you want to be in. Not this cutthroat. We're going to add more features and we're going to charge more less the, money. Yeah. And then we're going to charge more fees. And then we're going to say, it's like, yeah, you're going to go out of business. Yeah, you're going to make if, it. If, and if you keep playing that game of math where you're trying to convince your customer that your costs are way lower than the benefits, like you can't sustain that. Like responsibly, you cannot sustain that. Now you can, right. you can do child labor. Okay, great. Or you can, you know, whatever you guys like, deteriorate the uh, the U.S. market. But is that is that what you want to build your business on? Now, if so, then then just be transparent about it. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you know? That's true. Then to let people know, hey, this is us. But if yeah, you're yeah, hiding they're, it, they're going to find out anyway. Your customers are going to find out. There's- well, you know what's interesting too? We live in a world of transparency, right? And I think yeah. the more transparent a company can be, without saying proprietary stuff, obviously, but yeah. you know, I mean, a good example was um, my son who's 27 and his wife, um, they, they both graduated with honors from college and they're kicking ass. They're doing great stuff, but I will take them to lunch to treat them as a survey and they don't even know it. Right. And so, cause I'm, I'm a marketing guy. So I would, uh-huh. so I said to them, I said, Hey, when you land on a website, what's, what's your biggest annoyance? And here's the, you know, and these are millennials at the tail end of the millennials. And they both chimed in at the same time. They said, if you make me find out what your price is, I'm gone. I'm pissed. And I was like, whoa. I said, really? And, I, and they said, yeah. But not, and I said, but 99% of businesses don't, they don't want to say their price because then it's going to be a race to the bottom and all that stuff. Yeah. They said, well, we don't care. I don't want to have to call you. I don't have to do extra work to find out what you charge. And they won't call you. They won't call you to get a price. No, nope. and, and there and that goes. To, so the branding could almost be, and you tell me if I'm wrong here. It could almost be there could be a transparency aspect to it, the mm-hmm. brand, right? Yep. Where you're a little bit more just forthright and just fucking say whatever it is. I mean, not nothing negative, yeah. but I mean, does that make sense too? That you could be transparent as part of your brand. Yeah, it's you know what's hard in business to business because I've had some clients that are business to business, and one of the things that they do is they negotiate pricing based on volume. So if they post their price. Yeah. True. And, and some, you know, somebody who's buying onesies, twosies, and some else is buying like tens of thousands at a time. They're going, Hey, wait, why are you giving them this deal? Like, you know what? I, I like the idea of, a, of an MSRP. Is our MSRP? And please contact the salesperson to figure out if there's something that we can do for you. You know, because if you honestly, if someone's going to pay me, like, Hey, Ernie, we want you to come and speak at 10 conventions this year. Okay. You're going to get a better deal from me. Because I, I don't have to do as much work oh, to get sure. all these different bookings. Yep. So, yep. yeah, of course, I'm going to get a better deal for you. I, I, it's easier for me because I know how you work. I know the billing right. system. I know all those things. So, yeah, there's a there's a, a advantage, a cost advantage there. Yeah. So, yeah, yes, MSRP it's... is a good way to make sure that your price is out there. Because it also says we're a premium. That, 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 a price is a brand attribute like anything oh, else. Boy. You put a price up there, it's like, okay. Like when I go and speak, I tell people, 
I typically speak for five to 10 grand. Have yeah. I spoke for less? Yes. I don't want people to know, you know, don't tell sure, people sure. how much I didn't charge you. Yeah, right. But right. if I said, hey, look, I, I you know, I, I speak for 500 bucks. People are going to immediately go, this guy's oh, not good. Right? Because we associate dollars with value, in, like without even knowing. Like I could be one of the best speakers on the planet. I think I'm pretty good, but I could be one of the best speakers on the planet. But if I say I'm 500 bucks, you're going to say he's not as good as a $10,000 uh, speaker right. or a $20,000 speaker. We need, we need to get somebody really good. In fact, I've been in, in uh, when I used to be at Maverick, I was on the marketing team. So we would hire speakers in our annual conference. No doubt. If they're not charging at least 10 grand, they're not on the radar. Isn't that crazy? We're not looking for deals. We're yeah. looking for good people. And if they're not charging 10 grand, they don't have the confidence. They don't have the experience. Because if you, when you have confidence and experience, you're going to charge the higher price. You know what's so interesting? You're out of the running. You know what's interesting about that too is when you talk about brand, even with B2B companies and pricing, a lot of times um, I'll have discussions with my clients and say, when's the last time you raised your prices? Oh, we wouldn't do that. Oh, no, 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 no. I said, why not? Well, we wouldn't get any orders. We would, we, we'd, we'd go out of business. And I said, really? well, you're not providing the value to raise that price, that perceived value to raise the price to begin with. And that, that goes into customer experience, you know, the customer journey, all of those things, where mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't realize we could be charging more, but we need to up our game, right? Yeah. We, if we're like everybody else, talk about brand, if we're like everybody else, yeah. well, then I guess charge like everybody else. But if you yeah. want to up your game, then all of a sudden you come in the marketplace as the leader with the top price, your margins are better, your revenues go up. It's a, you know, it's a win-win for everybody. But hey, listen, we're winding down and there's something else I want to talk about. You mentioned in yeah. your notes, Chuck Norris. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> what, what is up with Chuck? Tell, tell the story with Chuck Norris. What's going on oh with that? Oh, my gosh. You got like, there are people that are so famous that you think there is no way I'd ever meet them, nor would oh. I know what to say when I meet this person, right? And so, um, and I'm super intimidated by people like that. And anyway, Chuck Norris. yeah, Chuck Norris, like Chuck Norris is a global phenomenon, like literally. Anyway, yes. we're, we were, uh, my team and I were trying to come up with a sweepstakes prize associated with our loyalty program that would be highly interesting to our core customer. Our core customer is like, you know, 18 to 45 year old men who work with their hands. They're kind of like their construction or, okay. you know, landscaping or whatever. These yeah. guys are thirsty. They're hungry. They're not on diets. They drink beer. They smoke cigarettes. I mean, they got the whole thing. They love mm -hmm. convenience stores. So what would a sweepstakes price look like that these guys would go crazy over? Not a washer and dryer set, not a yeah. new living room set. Okay. <laughs> That's what their wife wants. Yeah. Not what they want. Right. Right. So we said, let's come up with a, let's come up with a truck made by the diesel brothers on discovery channel. And we're going to call it truck Norris, the biggest, baddest truck on the planet. Wow. And it has like drawers for tools in the back. It's got like, a, you know, a, a, a torch, you know, blow it's, like torch a dude, thing. it's like a dude's dream, man. It's oh, a dream. it's a dude's nightmare, <laughs> nightmare. It's so good. <laughs> anyway, so we came up with this idea and we realized if we do this without Chuck Norris's permission, we're going to get sued because we're a big enough company that we're, we're going to get on the radar. So we reached out to Chuck Norris's people and six months later, we've got a no. Like, oh, all right. Well, we did a different campaign anyway. We did a truck and a boat, like that was that was which was totally awesome. Well, right in the middle of the truck and boat season, six months into like after we pitched it, I actually got a phone call from Gina Norris. Gina Norris said, "Hey, um, I heard that you wanted to do a promotion with us. Tell me a little bit about what your promotion is and where you work." So I'm like, <laughs> "Oh my you god!" Know? So I I tell her how excited I am about this truck Norris idea. Maverick at the time had like just under 300 stores and we were all over the mountain West. And she said, here's the deal. If we were to do something with you guys, it's probably going to start about $600,000 because that's the value that Chuck Norris brings, you know? And she said, we just like last year, we discovered water on our ranch. We were drilling an irrigation Hmm. Drilling for some irrigation for our ranch. 
and we hit an aquifer. Hmm. And this aquifer, we got it, the water we got tested, and it's like super clean, drinkable water. So we decided to build a water bottling plant across the street from our home. We're bottling the water. We have nobody to sell it. And we are having the hardest time getting our product in retailers. So I'm like, this is a dream come true. We'll do videos together. We'll do like all kinds of cool promotion with Chuck Norris, right? Because we'll have this Chuck Norris. We'll go down to Texas and film. Anyway, this all happens. We're down, and this story is really long, and there's a really great branding story as part of this. But um, so we are shooting video, promotional videos on his ranch with Truck Norris. It's got an American flag on both sides, you know. And uh, in the morning, we're, we're, we're shooting, and Chuck goes, he see, I was running. I went for a run that morning, and uh, he said, hey, do you want to work out with me today after we shoot? I'm like, there's no answer needed for this. It's like, <laughs> of course, right? So, uh, and then Gina, Gina comes out and says, hey, would you guys uh, come to dinner? So me uh, and my, the film crew says, come to the house. So we're like, oh yeah, we'll come. I said, can I bake some bread? And she's like, you'll bake some bread. I go, yeah, here's, I just need flour, water, yeast, salt. That's awesome. So just give me those things and I'll, I'll bake some bread. So she comes over, she, she has somebody brought off some stuff at the little cat. She's got little cabins on her property for visitors and guests. So I bake this bread. It's, it's rising while I'm working out with Chuck Norris. So I work out with him. And by the way, he was like 77 at the time. So this was like seven, six years ago. The dude is a machine. Love it. Like, love it. He, he worked me under the table. I, I'm a <laughs> daily late weightlifter, yoga workout guy. I, I do this all the time. He crushed me. I was sore for days afterwards. But he wasn't lifting super heavy. He would just keep going and going mm. like, like dozens of reps. So That's I'm incredible. Out, right? So anyway, he's 30 years older than me and he's killing me. Yeah. <laughs> so I find myself at the dinner table. I brought in fresh baked bread. Gina was all super excited about. We have this delightful conversation. I'm sitting to the, Chuck's at the head of the table. I'm at his right. Gina's across from me. We got the film crew and some of the, the water, the bottle, bottling plant guys on the table. And Chuck turns to me and says, hey, what do you want to do now? First of all, you know, I was Twitter paid the whole time, right? And so I'm super excited. And he goes, hey, what do you want to do now? And I go, well, you showed us your theater room. It would be the coolest thing if you and I and the crew here could go watch a Chuck Norris movie with Chuck oh, Norris. Oh, wow. Damn. And he looked at me and he goes, slap the table. And he goes, let's do it. And That's so awesome. like five minutes later, I'm on a lazy boy recliner with a huge piece of apple pie ice cream on top of it. Chuck Norris to my right as the opening credits to Force of one roll. Wow. <laughs> like oh a tear my comes God. My yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. Like he's, the sweetest, he's the sweetest, nicest guy. And if you ever call my phone number, Chuck Norris answers my phone. No oh, kidding. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. If I don't answer it, Chuck will. <laughs> dude, dude you, you, you know, it's, um, I hope, uh, I hope you get more traction on LinkedIn because uh, you. You, you are a presence, man. I mean, and it was so awesome to have you on. Um, so before we forget critical stuff, yeah. if people want to find out about you and just contact you and your book and all that, give us all yep. the information, website addresses, whatever you're comfortable giving, give it to us now. You betcha. Easy thing. My website, earnburn.com. It's E-R-N-B-U-R-N. Earnburn.com. And then my LinkedIn is Ernie-Harker, H-A-R-K-E-R. Okay. So the name those of, are the, the two best ways to find me. And the name of the book, Your Brand Sucks. And that's, yep. I'm, I'm assuming Amazon. It's on Amazon. Okay. Yep. Okay, cool. So yep. awesome. Thank you so much for your time. This was amazing. Please. What you did on LinkedIn with that thing with me was just, it was very, very cool. It was Thank so, you, I mean, Thank you. That, that definitely, that, that made an imprint in me for, for a long time to come. So that was very impressive. But thank okay. you so much for being on. Thank you for having me. You've just listened to the Dominate Your Market podcast with CEO, business consultant, and author, Michael Peterson. 
growth-minded CEOs hire Michael to explode their revenues, build an amazing company, and create a transformational mindset that encapsulates growth, success, and ultimately, happiness. His book, Dominate Your Market, is creating quite a stir in the marketplace. Go to dominateyourmarketbook.com and get your first chapter free.